For centuries, the Byzantine Empire survived internal conflicts and external threats. It became the center of the trading world and the focus of Christianity. But just as religion served to hold the empire together, it also tore it apart. The fall of Byzantium, this time on the Western tradition. And now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. Last time we ended with a statement that the Greek Orthodox Church was critical to the unity, even to the survival, of the Byzantine Empire. In the United States, with our constitutional separation of church and state, it's sometimes hard to understand just how powerful a political force religious institutions can be. But in the Byzantine Empire, the church was one with the state and it prospered when the empire prospered. Now that made it very different from the Latin church, which never quite identified itself with the Roman state. At first, of course, it was persecuted but even when it became the state religion, it tried to stay autonomous. When the Eastern Church sent out missionaries like these, however, they were also ambassadors of the Byzantine state. And the pagan rulers they converted became political allies of the empire as well, or at least it was hoped they would so become. The best example of this religious diplomacy occurred in the 9th century when two missionaries, Cyril and Methodius, later canonized, produced a script and liturgy that would be adopted by the Bulgarians and by the Slavs of the Balkans. In the 10th century, the Slavs of Russia adopted them too, and that is why today the script of the Russians is Kyrillic, or if you like, Cyrillic. The other side of the coin, however, was that religious dissent in the Byzantine Empire easily turned into political division and vice versa. The political stability of the empire, even its unity, were affected by theological disputes. One sometimes feels that theological disputation was the Byzantines' favorite sport, more so even than chariot racing. But some of these disputes were going to have dire long-term results. One of them was a long-standing difference between the orthodox view that Christ had two natures, human and divine, and a rival belief which held that Christ had no humanity, only one nature which was totally divine. The people who believed in one nature were called monophysites, literally one-naturists. Monophysites were particularly numerous in Egypt and Syria where their different vision of Christ came in very useful to affirm political differences against the central government in Constantinople. And so the dispute went on for a couple of centuries and it became particularly bitter in the 7th century just when unity was needed most as a new and explosive force burst onto the world stage. 
In the Arabian Peninsula, a prophet had arisen. His name was Muhammad, and in just a few years, he united the fierce, warlike Arab tribes into a confederation dedicated to the spread of a new religious message, the message of Islam. Mohammed's revelation was that there was only one God, Allah, and Mohammed was his prophet. There had been other prophets, Moses, Jesus, but Mohammed said he was the last and the only one to reveal the whole truth of what God was about. The religion he preached was simple and accessible, a strict monotheism with none of the complications that Christians had developed, a straightforward ritual rather similar to that of the Jews and related to cleanliness and hygiene, the emphasis of basic virtues like courage, charity, hospitality, and the important promise that those who fell in battle for the faith went straight to a paradise which the holy book of Islam, the Quran, described in detail and which sounds a lot more fun than the paradise of Christians or Jews. Combined with military force, the message of Islam proved very potent indeed. In the ten years before his death in 632, Muhammad had united all the tribes and cities of Arabia. By 644, 12 years after his death, Egypt and Libya had fallen to Islam, as well as Syria, Iraq and Persia. By the time the century ended, Arab armies had overthrown what was left of the Persian Empire, they had laid siege to Constantinople and within another 15 years they had spread from India to Spain. Part of the secret of their success was that they were not quite as barbaric as they seemed. Arabia had long been a crossroads for trade in spices and perfumes and slaves. And Mohammed himself was a merchant in Mecca, which was a great merchant town, and found his first support in Medina, another merchant town. Muhammad also knew a lot about Jewish and Christian beliefs. Here he is depicted riding next to Jesus, which shows that the Arabs were not so isolated as one might think. Another part of Arab success was that they were Semites, speaking a Semitic tongue close to the Aramaic spoken by common people from Iraq to Palestine. Perhaps the most crucial factor was their relative religious tolerance. This is a scene from a Passover service held in Spain under Muslim rule. Muslims did not try to exterminate those who believed in Judaism, Christianity or anything else. They simply asserted a higher revelation which made Muslims the chosen people entitled to special privileges on earth and exclusive access to heaven and which left non-Muslims as second-class citizens tolerated but a bit despised. Muslims didn't have to pay taxes, only non-Muslims pay taxes and this was a strong argument for conversion course, and an equally strong argument for Muslims to tolerate the non-believers around them. And while non-Muslims had to shoulder the entire tax burden, they paid no more, often less, than they had done before being conquered. Moreover, if they were religious dissenters at loggerheads with Constantinople, and with the Orthodox Church, they invariably felt freer to worship in their own way under Muslim rule than they did under Byzantine rule. This is the story of the Coptic Church in Egypt, Monophysites who preferred Muslim tolerance to Orthodox persecution.
But Muslim tolerance was not just about taxes and non-believers. An attractive characteristic of the Arabs was that they were culturally tolerant, curious, ready to adapt traditions they found in the civilizations they conquered. They took over the Persian and Byzantine forms of government, complete with bureaucracy and absolutism, but they also preserved the cultural heritage of Greece and Persia, philosophy and geography, astronomy, mathematics, chemistry, and in many cases they improved on them. Arabic became what Greek had been to the Hellenistic world, the common language of an Islamic world that ran from the East Indies to Spain. It created a sort of international network of letters and science where writers in Spain could affect thinkers in Persia and where philosophers from India could read what was written in North Africa. The Arabs transmitted the works of Aristotle, who is depicted here in a 13th century manuscript, and the works of Plato when both were forgotten in the West. The Arabs picked up Greek medical science as perfected in Persia and passed it on. This, for instance, is a doctor preparing a batch of cough syrup. And Arab medicine was sufficiently in advance of European medicine that when the first European medical school was founded at Salerno in Italy in the 10th century, it was staffed by Muslims. Their architecture influenced Western designs, especially the minarets of their mosques, which are reflected in our bell towers. They borrowed from the Hindus what we now call Arabic numerals. They introduced a Chinese invention, paper, and we can see by the words we've taken from them, algebra, alcohol, zenith, zero, how much they affected our sciences as well. Militarily, Islam was checked in the 8th century. In 718, the Arabs were stopped in the east after a year-long siege of Constantinople. And in 733, they were driven out of Gaul by the Franks but the influence of their civilization was going to affect backward Europe for centuries to come. Another instance of religious conflict with long-range effects was a long and bitter struggle dividing Christians between those who worshipped icons, that is, images like these of Abraham or David, and those who wanted to ban icons and were known as iconoclasts, literally breakers of images. In this Byzantine manuscript, a group of bishops expresses strong disapproval of an image of Christ. Now, icons depicting Christ, the Virgin Mary, and a variety of saints had become tremendously popular objects of worship related to healing, protection, and all kind of miracles. Here again, a profound cultural difference divided East and West. It was the eastern provinces, closer to Jewish and Muslim traditions, which bred the greatest opposition to the worship of icons. The West, meanwhile, regarded eastern iconoclasm as sacrilege and heresy. This issue divided the empire for over a hundred years between 726 when one Byzantine emperor, Leo III, ordered all icons destroyed and 843 when the icons were finally reinstated for good. It also quite literally helped to divide Christendom between Rome and Constantinople because the Patriarch of Constantinople stood for iconoclasm while the Pope of Rome stood against it. 
This meant that after the 8th century, the Roman popes no longer looked for support from Constantinople against the barbarians. Instead, they turned to barbarians for support in the religious struggles against Constantinople. Actually, the formal break in Christendom was going to come in 1054 when Pope Leo IX in Rome and Patriarch Michael Cerularius in Constantinople excommunicated each other. That was when the political division that had been growing between East and West for centuries was confirmed by a religious division which persists today. Officially, the break came because when Romans and Byzantines stopped disagreeing about icons, uh, they disagreed about whether priests should marry or wear beards, and whether the bread in the sacrament should be leavened or not, and whether the creed, the official statement of the most essential articles of faith, whether the creed should have the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son, or from the Father through the Son. Behind the doctrinal differences, however, lay the immemorial contempt of the Latin for the Greek, and the disdain of the legitimate empire in Constantinople for the upstart empire in the West, which was now run by barbarians. And behind that, there must have been, too, the simple fact that the empire was no longer united in any way, that its parts had become quite different with one speaking in Latin and the other in Greek. So the Mediterranean world, which had once been knit together by a bilingual culture, was now split into two halves which could no longer understand each other. The only thing that East and West had in common by the 8th or the 9th century was the agreement that Constantinople was the city, the great marketplace, the focus of the Christian and the trading world. Constantinople had paved streets that ran for miles. It was lined by arcades full of countless shops with running water in every quarter, with a hippodrome greater than the Colosseum, and four gilded horses above the emperor's box, which were later stolen by the Venetians to adorn the facade of their basilica. And above everything, the wonder of Santa Sophia, the great cathedral which had been rebuilt by the Emperor Justinian in the 6th century after the previous church had been burnt down in a riot. The harbor was crowded, the bazaars were full of people and goods from all over the world. As one visitor explained in 1161, great stir and bustle prevails in Constantinople in consequence of the conflux of many merchants who resort there both by land and sea from all parts of the world, from Babylon and Mesopotamia, from Media and Persia, from Egypt and Palestine, from Russia and Hungary, and from the West. You can get a vague idea of what it was like by looking at the site today or by looking at architecture which imitates the Byzantine style from the domes of churches in Moscow to this one in Perigueux in France and by looking at Venice where St. Mark's is the 11th century copy of a 6th century Byzantine church and where many of the palaces are touched by the Byzantine style. But in the 9th and 10th centuries, when Constantinople was the wonder of Christendom, the West was backward. It didn't have much to offer the East in exchange for its silks and spices. A bit of iron and timber, 
slaves who were mostly captured or kidnapped Slavs, hence the term slave, and eventually woolen textiles which would improve the balance of trade. But for a long time, the Byzantines despised Westerners as barbarians, which they were, and as poor barbarians, which was worse. And the Westerners despised Byzantines as effeminate, devious, and wicked. They ate fancy food, they wore fancy clothes, they washed far too much, and the women painted themselves, and the men hired other men to fight for them. So Westerners looked down on Byzantines, but they also envied their riches. And this attraction which drew them to the glamour and the splendor of Constantinople was dangerous because if all roads led to the city, to New Rome, then everybody was likely to wind up there with fair intentions or foul. The Byzantine Empire had already been beset by a number of pressures, from the Turks in Anatolia, the Normans in Italy and Greece, and especially the Italian sea powers, Genoa, Pisa and Venice. Finally, in 1202, Venice convinced some 30,000 crusaders who were unable to pay for transport to Muslim Egypt to conquer Venice's rebel Christian port city Zara instead. The pirate crusaders then moved on to Constantinople with the flimsiest of excuses and they took the city in 1204. This is an artist's rendering of the event done a long time later. And this is Venice, which was the primary beneficiary when the Byzantine Empire, its riches and trade fell into Western hands. It was Venice that went on to dominate the Eastern Mediterranean. And the shadow of the Byzantine Empire that survived disappeared in 1453 when the Turks delivered the coup de grace by capturing Constantinople. You can imagine then how difficult it was for the people of Constantinople to live in a pot of honey when the land was full of wasps. Towards the end of the empire, the life of the average East Roman was a life of care. They were afraid of the ruthless tax collector, of the arbitrary tyranny of the imperial governor, of the devouring land hunger of the powerful, of the recurrent menace of barbarian invasion. It's to the credit of the Byzantine world to the credit of the tradition of Christian charity and social justice, which it often incorporated, that it realized this burden of fear and perennial danger and tried to lighten it by building hospitals for the sick, for lepers, for the disabled, by building hostels for pilgrims like these and strangers and old people, by building maternity homes for women and refuges for abandoned children and the poor, well-endowed institutions with elaborate charters telling just how they were to be administered. The Byzantines listened to the texts they heard in church, one of which inspired the future Saint Anthony to become a hermit. If you would be perfect, Go sell all you have and give to the poor and come follow me. Many people followed this advice and they did it the more readily since in the insecurity of their time material goods could come and go very quickly anyway. Life was insecure and dangerous and religious vocations as well as outbreaks of violence and cruelty were the natural consequence. The world of our own time ought to make it easier for us to understand the passions of the Byzantine world, the problems it faced.
the fears under which it labored, and the simple feat of endurance it performed. Because finally that's what remains, the historic function of Constantinople as the outpost of Europe against the invading hordes of Asia. Under the shelter of that defense of its eastern gateway, Western Europe could refashion its own life. And it's hardly an exaggeration to say that the civilization of Western Europe is a byproduct of the will of the Byzantine Empire to survive. Next time, the Dark Ages. Until then. information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.